Hey, we're back. We're live on a given Thursday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. The handsome young man is Ethan Allen. <clears throat> he's, a, he's a scientist with APCSS, joins us from time to time. He's in the Think Tech family for many years, and we talk about likable science. That's what we're here for. Good morning, Ethan. Good morning, Jay. How are you doing? We're good. Um, so the question, you know, maybe this is a really short show. Are there, are there flying cars in our future, question mark? Eh, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's, have, go ahead it's a technology that's been developed already it's it's not going to be undeveloped you know it's just going to go on the question really is how fast are they going to be in you know become common that may be decades down the road certainly. well from the technology point of view i think what i hear you saying is we could do this today but, but it has to be socialized in the marketplace and, and it has to be socialized in the regulatory community. And if we could get past those two things, it, we could have flying cars today. Is that right? That's pretty much right. I mean, the technology, the basic technology is there, but, but we're really sort of, I think, at a, not even a Model T uh, level. Um, yes, they built some nice prototypes. Uh, they can do cute things. You know, they can fly 25 miles on a single charge. Uh, they can carry a person. Uh, that's nice. They're you know hideously expensive at this point. Um, yes, building a so sort of social social acceptance, having people understand that hey, these are very neat to have. It's very cool to be able to do this. And then, as you say, the regulatory business is just going to be um, <clears throat> a real headache to deal with. Yeah, well, you know, it just struck me that uh, this is sort of like uh, Kitty Hawk. As a matter of fact, Kitty Hawk is 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 one of the companies involved. I um, think you know it's nice to do this on a on a remote beach in in North or South Carolina, which is where, where Kitty Hawk is, um, and um, you know, or on a field somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But, uh, the, you know, the dream come true would be that you'd have this kind of um, or, or automated technology that would allow uh, the, the flying car to fly right over your city street. Um, and I think that, you know, even assuming that we can get more than 25 miles of range, uh, even assuming that we can, you know, get the best technology and improve the best technology to make, make it fly. I think there's a long way to go on the software where you could have multiple flying cars in the city, not not crashing into each other. Uh, where are they on that? Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that's a huge issue. I mean, right now they are classified as ultralight flying machines, basically, and they don't really need to be regulated. But they cannot fly over urban areas. They cannot fly over airports. Um, and yes, at some point that'll have to be dealt with because. Um, even if you have good self-driving or self-flying uh, automation in them, still, once you put them over congested areas, they're, they're, bad things are bound to happen sooner or later, right? And you don't really want one of these things falling out of the sky onto a busy city street. Um, uh, yeah, so how, how are they gonna regulate these? What kind of safety precautions are gonna have to be put in place? What, you know, what kind of insurance are they gonna have to have on them? Yeah, huge number numbers of different questions, um, and yes, I mean the, the as long as they were constrained with relatively small range, relatively tiny payloads, um, they're not terribly practical for for sort of widespread use. So they'll never be more. Well, than you, that. you and I, we have a half an hour to design a pathway for that. But first, <clears throat> believe it or not, uh, we have a, a viewer who's way ahead of us here. And the viewer has asked a question I want to put to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you to the viewer for doing that. Unless we require everyone to get pilot's licenses, it seems that flying cars will need to be smarter than on-road cars. Probably having true general, true general artificial intelligence. Since level five autonomy is much farther away than we had hoped and may be unreachable, <clears throat> Uh, even for road cars, how can we safely have skies full of flying cars? Well, you touched on that a minute ago, but is it possible? 
Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think that's unreasonable to suggest that that you know everyone who's flying these is going to have to have a pilot's license, then they're going to become common. They're just not that many people have either the capability or the time or the energy or the money to get the pilot's license, right? It's a fairly complex process. Um, you know, and so it's going to depend, I think, on the automation getting better to where they, they become essentially self-flying. Besides, for any utility, you, if, you, if you demand there's a pilot in it, you've immediately increased your payload a great deal, right? Pilot is, is in there, and that just cuts down on what more you can carry. So from a simple logistics point of view, you really want these to be flying themselves so that, you know, the pilot isn't part of the payload, right? Well, don't you think there'll come a time? I mean, let's... Assuming this catches, you know, and becomes a reality, what do you think there'll come a time when you won't need a pilot's license? Where you get in the machine and right. like GPS, you punch in your destination and it takes you there. What, what do you what expertise do you need for that? No, absolutely. I, I think that's that's the only way, that's a prerequisite basically for them to become popular. Um, and so the question is, yes, can we get that level of reliable autopiloting um, technology? And yeah, it's trickier probably than, than a car because you've got, you've got third dimension to deal with. Um, but that technology is developing very rapidly all the time. I mean, right now, you know, the technology for self-driving cars, which is still admittedly really in, in its infancy, has a far lower uh, per passenger mile fatality, fatal accident rate. Uh, it's a, that, that rate is about a quarter of that of human-driven vehicles. Um, and, and yet, as I, you know, we're still sort of just prototyping that. So this automation technology can and will develop better and better. And yes, until that happens, though, I don't, I don't think that the, the flying cars can really take off, as it were. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, to I, I totally agree. It's a sequential thing. The first thing we do is we reach a certain level of perfection of the flying of the, uh, the terrestrial cars, <laughs> and and uh, when we see that that works, and we have a very 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 low rate of accident and um, God forbid fatality, um, you know where people you know say can clearly come to the conclusion that it's safer to be an automated car than a, a human driven car. Um, once we get to that point. Then I think the automated technology will will be worthy of flying cars, but until then, it's really it's not going to be a reality, not in the practical sense. Yes, and and you're quite right. There's a real socialization aspect to that because already it is inarguable. Yes, that, that you're much safer off in an automated driven car. I mean, so just saying that the fatal accident rate is a quarter of that of human driven vehicles. So, um, you know. Any, anyone with any sense would do that, but you don't see a lot of them yet. Um, there's a, a whole social acceptance. Now, part of it with flying cars, we may not be, there may not be a hurdle because we are all, everyone's used to driving their own car, right? Everyone's used to, you know, they've seen their grandparents did it, their parents did it, they do it. You know, everyone does that. None of us have really flown, our, not many of us have flown our own planes, right? So we're not, we don't have that sort of social hurdle to get past about giving up the control of the of your piloting because you know you get in a commercial jet and you've given up that control right somebody's up there piloting it so um yeah so we may that that hurdle may not be as big a one but there's still going to be a yeah some some significant barrier there well you know and the, and the other thing is uh you know is this federal or is this state it's the old story the states retain a lot of jurisdiction if you will over cars and automated cars, and the federal government has been you know, tentative about getting involved, I think. The federal government, in my view, should just control the whole thing. So you have uniformity among the states. That would have to happen with the, with the flying uh, cars. Um, you, you can't have different rules for different, different areas. You have to be able to cross a state line without worrying about whether you, you know, comply in the new state. Um, it has to be a federal, uh, a federal system, don't you think? Yes, it would certainly be very awkward. <clears throat> you know, a road, you can say, it road crosses the state line here at this point, and you can change the rules if you want, you can change your speed limit, whatever you want. But yes, if you're flying across open woods, how do you really know where that state line is when you've gone from one state to another? Um, 
that. I mean, yes, when GPS, it can tell you, yes, you're now approaching the border, and yes, now you're on the border and you crossed it. And so in theory, the states could do it, but I agree. I think it makes much more sense to try to do it federally. Um, think about the rules that you have around airports and around cities, which are going to have to really be very tightly regulated for these things, right? You cannot have these things flying over airports, right? That's, you know, that's just crazy uh, because, uh, you know, the, the potential for accidents with incoming or outgoing commercial flights is, is horrendous. Um, and so, yeah, if, if every state is controlling it, there's just going to be a mishmash of different kinds of rules, how far, how high, you know, uh, um, and it makes much more sense. But I agree with you to have feds uh, write, write the regs on it. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's easy to program the thing. This will all be a question of software, right? So we don't want it to go near an airport. Well, we'll put the airport in its GPS system and say this thing cannot go, cannot go anywhere near that airport. You know, you can huff and puff and stamp your feet. It cannot go anywhere near that airport. Um, so you don't have to worry about steering it away. It will not go there. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a robotic kind of thing, I think, that, you know, that would be built into its... GPS navigational system. You know, the, the thing that troubles me about uh, the flying cars, I mean, of course, they got these rotors uh, sort of like a drone, um, and they go up and down, straight up and down. They're in a runway, I don't think, most of them. There, there are a number of them. I'm just looking at the New York Times article, um, there were, you know, three, four, five of them out there now, and they're raising capital, and they're developing technology. They're even developing technology that can build the technology. I thought that's interesting. Uh, they're they're not buying the components; they're making the components. Anyway, so if you have rotors, okay, you talked about this a minute ago. If it falls out of the sky, um, you run out of gas, uh, electrical charge. Um, your rotors break. Your navigational system breaks. Could, could happen. Um, something breaks, and now it's not a question of finding a soft landing. It's coming down right now on whoever is down there. Uh, I don't know how you fix that. Any ideas? Yeah, no, they they have, uh, at least these early designs have no glide slope at all. They, they drop like rocks if, if things go wrong up in the air. Um, and one presumes you would try to build in, again, into your software, all kinds of alerts. So if it sees the least kind of thing potentially going wrong, just immediately says, find the nearest good spot to land and get down. Uh, as quickly as you can, basically, uh, because yeah, you, you you can't afford to have stuff go wrong. I mean, a, you know, a small hyper cover a Cessna can fly, can cut out its engine, can glide for some, you know, quite some distance if it's got some altitude, and restart the engine and go from there. Um, but uh, the, these really can't. We can't do that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Well, okay. You no, know, but you can set, as you suggest, you can set up a malfunction system uh, that gets a handle on it using AI. You know, anything. You know, sensors about everything that's happening in the aircraft, the car craft, um, and um, and when anything sounds like it might go wrong, uh, the thing looks for a place. It uh, maybe it uh, it, it uh, starts a siren or something. Let people know it's coming down, and then it tries to come down as gracefully as possible. Um, as soon as possible, uh, so that uh, you know it's no crash. Right, and right. it seems to me this is a whole new technology we have to work on to to achieve that. Yeah, because it's one thing right if you're driving your electric car and your you, your charge runs out and you pull to the side of the road, it's one thing. But yeah, your your flying car has got to know that it's getting low on charge and it's going to land before it runs out of charge. Yeah, right. Uh, but, well, let Let's assume for a moment, Ethan, let's just, let's make some wild assumptions here. Let's assume that they solve that problem. Let's assume they can get a, a range of way more than 25 miles. Uh, let's assume they, they have a navigational and a software system that will, you know, be able to handle it without a, without a licensed pilot, uh, without a pilot. Really, it's automated. The whole thing is automated. Um, and let's assume it's really, you know, bulletproof, that it's not going to fail. It's all kinds of fail-safe systems built into it. I mean, I think this is this is something that uh, engineers and software engineers could really figure out, and uh, um, and maybe one or more of those various competing entrepreneurs that are building or trying to build these things will come up with various systems, and they'll be 
um, you know, they'll collaborate. And there's some big company will put some big money into it before you know it. Uh, all the problems we've identified here would be resolved. Okay. So let's assume it really works. Let's assume it's from flyover a city. <clears throat> What's the benefit? Well, there are several benefits. One, if if you if you start becoming popular, you're gonna they're gonna take a certain amount of traffic off the road as people will would rather fly in a straight line from point A to point B than drive in some weird convoluted way through heavy traffic. Um, they should be faster, you know. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of for obvious appeal to it to, to anyone too who. Uh, I mean, the idea of just being able to go walk out your door, pop in this little thing, punch a button, and zzz, you know, fly through the air to some place 50 miles away, in presumably in you know 20 minutes or something, uh, it, it is very appealing, right? And, and it, it's it's going to be a real selling point. Uh, yeah, it's. Or how do we get from here to there? Is a question: How fast can that happen? How fast will it happen? Well, it's the old beeline thing, you know. If I fly a beeline, instead of taking twists and turns in a road and stopping for traffic lights and traffic and what have you, I'm going to get there in a small fraction of the time that it takes me to drive, even if I, even if I drive well, even if the roads in that area are good. <clears throat> the bottom line is if it works perfectly let, uh, for this discussion, let's assume that, um, I can get where I, where I need to go. Uh, really quickly. And so if I have, say, a range of 100 or 200 or 500 miles on the thing, um, I'm not going to use nearly as much of that range as I would were I driving an electric car right. <laughs> or a gas car. It, it would be, uh, relatively speaking, immediate. Right. In that sense, that are, they're sort of more efficient, although, you know, you're, you're using a lot of energy to lift something like that up off the ground. That's you know, that's going to be again one of the big technical challenges is how do they how do you get batteries that are powerful enough, old enough charge, long lasting enough, and light enough? You know, you know you can't use your lead based batteries in a in an aircraft, right? You want yeah. like an air based battery or a hydrogen based battery or something? You know. Well, are we are we anywhere close to that? Talking about that as a digression, I mean, it seems to me as you say. Um, car, car, electric car batteries are heavy. Although a, they're not as heavy as they were a few years ago, and b, they're not nearly as expensive as they were a few years ago. So we made progress in that regard. Right. And suffice to say, if you make a little, you know, it's that certain law that what every computer, you know, doubles in its capacity every year. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a mathematical progression here uh, where you can anticipate if a lot of people are doing research on this kind of technology, maybe even um, developing a sort of trickle charge from solar. Who knows what you could do with a with, a, with an electric, a rather a flying car. Um, is you think it's doable within our lifetime? Do you think it's doable at all? Yes. I mean, I, you know, if you look at technologies uh, and technologies that were introduced a century ago, you know, took, 30 or 40 years sometimes to get, to get widespread. And, and more and more recently, the time from the technology's inception to its wide adoption has shrunk. Um, cell phones were, you know, were adopted pretty, pretty quickly. Electric cars, I mean, electric cars looks like they're being adopted pretty quickly. Self-driving cars, that seems like that's a little more of a of a being a little slower. So yeah, um it, it's 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 a balance there. It's the you say, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors. If the first few that go up work very well, work flawlessly, that will really encourage more people to invest and, and to push the whole thing. If you have a bad crash or two early on, uh, that'll that'll be very, uh, you know, could, could set the field back. Yeah, for calls for regulation and all that, you know, slow. The, the tension between um, regulator, regulated regulating government and, and the industry and people. So yeah, that it could uh, fall out of the sky, may I say, that way. But let me let me go to another another uh, point on this. It's the implications. Let's assume the car works. Let's assume it has range, it has uh, lightness, it, it has good 
navigational software that's not going to crash into anything. <clears throat> um, all of that. Um, um, and let's assume that the public loves it. Uh, there are implications to our society because if the public loves it, there'll be a lot of them up there. And the question is, when you get to your destination, what do you do with the thing? It's not like you pack it up in a suitcase and you know walk it up to your office. No, no, no. Um, things are changing about offices and now things are changing about whether you should go into your office. COVID has taught us that maybe we don't have to go in. Maybe transportation is not as critical for the workaday world as it used to be. Um, so, but you do have, nevertheless, a, a problem about what to do with it when you get there. And then finally, what implication does it have for the existing roadway and transportation system? You give that up or you modify that to allow for this additional option? Yeah, and, and one might look at the, the current, uh, the Hui group here in Hawaii, right? Who, they've got lots of little spots around where they park a few vehicles. You get on your phone, you say, I want this kind of vehicle. You walk in there, punch in a code, get in, you drive it wherever you want. You basically leave it at the Hui spot at the, you know, where you get out. It's used again by somebody else. That's, I think, economically, the only way these things will work is you won't own them individually. Some company will own them and make sure that thing's being used virtually 24 7, except when it's information. Um, that's that's the, it's the Uber model, isn't it? It's Uber in other words, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know if you remember that old video about um, the guys fishing, doing ice fishing. And uh, it's really funny. He's doing ice fishing in the middle of a lake and he wants to have a beer. And so he he uh, telephones the um, you know the store on the side of the lake, and they send him a beer with a drone. Um, the FAA got down on that; they thought that was really a bad ad. <laughs> no, I mean, but you know, the idea is you call for the service, you right. call for the Uber. You do, as you said, you don't own it. It's silly to have private ownership of this sort of thing. You have a fleet like an Uber fleet, uh, and they and they they come to your door, pick you up, and drop you off. That's right. the way it's got to work. Yeah. They do, they're doing big data search. They know essentially what times, where they should have more of their vehicles stationed, basically, because of likely demand. Yeah, um, they'll know when if you drop somebody off. If that's not a likely pickup spot, you, you fly the vehicle somewhere else uh, to a, a better spot where it's more, more likely to be needed soon. Yeah, that, that's all, again, I think that's all got to be part of it to make, that, make this thing work. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the roadway. I mean, I don't envision that our roadways are going to go away anytime soon. So, uh, they hopefully would become less congested, and since hopefully most, if not all, the cars on them by then will be uh, self-driving, automated driving, presumably with a, a near flawless system, our rates of, of traffic accidents and, and fatalities will, will plummet. Um, so the, the two could be very nicely complementary in that sense. You know? Um, yeah, but even even if um, you know these these um, flying cars are really very efficient, they're not going to be able to do you know long hauls. It's short short hauls, and and I and I think that the um, you know the um, the air air industry, air air, air airline industry will remain vital. Um, although there's pressure to make them electric too. I don't think there's much progress, but there is pressure. It's a fuel thing and a uh, greenhouse gas thing. You know, ideally, we have these new aircraft that that fly without using fossil fuels. But <clears throat> but I think they they have to stay in business for the long haul. These are only short term. They're like taxis. They right. just like taxis. So that that raises the question <clears throat> of um, you know where where do you deploy them? Where is the Uber located? Uh, and what happens in a case of bad weather? What, <clears throat> what happens if it's raining or snowing or, you know, windy? I mean, all those things would have a, a, a significant effect um, on, on the system. Right. Uh, what do you do to compensate for that? Yeah, there's two, two interesting points you, you raised now. One, note that all these prototype uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that are being developed use electric engines. None of them, as far as I understood, use uh, a, a fuel-based, a, a standard internal combustion engine. They're just too, it's too heavy, too inefficient. They're all using electric motors. So, um, 
But yes, so if you envision that, that the automated uh, system safety and navigation systems are so good, one presumes that same kind of level of, of sophistication will, will be applied to terrestrial vehicles too. <clears throat> and therefore you should be able to sort of cram a lot more cars on the road without slowing things down. And even should speed up even with more cars on the road. If they're all, if all the cars know where one another is or one another are, they're all paying attention to each other. They're all driving. They're not going to get up in big blocks where they slow down. They'll space themselves out. They'll, they'll keep traffic flowing much better. So in some sense, those industries are going to compete against each other too, right? Um, because yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that <clears throat> first of all, going forward with AI and um, terrestrial electric automated cars, you have to have system control. You know, it's like that thing with the with you, you can get in a certain lane, a fast lane, um, but you have to pay, and the cost of being in that lane depends on how many other people want to be in that lane. It's all, you know, it's automated on an AI basis, and it's calculated to make the, the whole system most efficient. Um, and, and the charge you pay is a way that that can be, you know, controlled. Okay, uh, good. Now you have uh, flying cars. Well, likewise, you have to have a system for the flying cars. You, 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 you know, even the best AI navigational technology requires some control of all the cars. And if the airspace, for example, is too crowded, um, you know, you want to control the system in one way if it, it's, it's uh, or the price. Uh, if it's not so crowded, you want to control it in another way and including the price. Now, here's the big one. OK, if I have an interchangeable system where some people um, might take the flying Uber uh, and other people might take the terrestrial Uber, because, I, you know, I think the same thing's going to happen to automated cars. You won't own it yourself. It'll be somebody that drives up to your door at a certain time, an automated, an automated Uber. Um, so if I have, a, a, say, a system that's controlled electronically with AI on the ground, then I have another system that's controlled in the same way in the air with flying cars. The two systems are really part of one system because if the weather's bad or who knows what, then you know that people are going to take the other option. So, so you have to create a, a comprehensive system, including the terrestrial automated cars plus the flying cars all together now. Am right. I right? And how do you do that? And who's going to do that? Right. I mean, yes, some Uber of the future, right, basically. Uh, and I think you're right. I think the systems would have to be linked together uh, in any, certainly in any sensible arrangement uh that they, they'd be linked um because as you say that it's just a question you know you're in point a you want to get to point b yeah it may take a little longer on the ground but you know maybe the cost half as much maybe it's worth it you know um there's going to be all that calculation to be made um now they project you know as the guys, the guys who look at this project they can make these things competitively priced basically on a per mile basis again i'm, I'm not going to hold my breath for that um I do think it will happen. I think we'll begin to see them coming out. I wouldn't be surprised in the next decade if we if we began to see a, a, a trickle of them, you know. But um, yeah, you think we, you know, I, I think about the world with its uh, hundreds of countries, and I think about all the developing countries where people don't have a lot of money, <clears throat> and I think about whether this would ever work there, and I think about the you know the disparity even in our country of people who could afford to fund this and who could not afford to fund it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's likely to cost a bit of money going forward, especially in the development phase, uh, until it all settles down and gets you know, economies of scale. And so the question is, you know, how, on top of all we've discussed, what about the disparity? What about servicing you know, the population, the consuming public, if you will, uh, who, some of whom can afford it and some of whom can't? Sounds like there's a lot of challenges between where we are now and this utopian world of uh, automated transportation. Um, do you see how that would work? I mean, can we look into the future now and see how the evolution would take place? No, that's, that's a that's a very, very, very sort of deep question. Yeah, uh, with these 
exacerbate the inequity in our, in our society? Uh, and is there a way to make them not do so? Is there a way to make them part of making a more equitable society? That's a, a very tricky one because as you say, they're gonna have to, particularly in the early stages, they're gonna be very expensive to invest in. Um, and the, the investors are gonna wanna get their return. And you know, it's, I mean, they're, fundamentally they're gonna be developed by capitalist system, right? And uh, it will be, you know, if you can pay, you can you can enjoy it. And if you can't, you don't. Uh, so you think uh, they would be developed by a capitalist system? I mean, right now, looking at the article in the Times, uh, it seems to me that's just a lot of what do you want to call it? Private capital, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial talent, uh, you know, involved in this field, and the government isn't doing anything. Um, but when you have to regulate it, as we discussed on a national basis, and you have to you know set the rules, set the set the the guardrails. On a national basis, you're also saying, aren't you, that the federal government might put some money in? It can't. It can't let this remain as a what do you want to call it a, 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 a wild a, a wild west kind of uh, uh, everybody on his own uh, no. industry. It has. It has to be big capital. It has to be probably. It has to be government incentives and uh, government encouragement. Uh, otherwise, it won't happen. Don't you think? I, I would agree. I, I think there's, you're going to have to have some serious role for the government in regulation of it, uh, how how they can be used, where they can fly, how they interact with you know commercial planes, and, and uh, yeah, there's sort of a, a thousand different questions where essentially some federal uh, input is going to be needed, and yeah, that's going to cost governmental money too. Very exciting stuff, and and here's my <clears throat> takeaway. You can think about your takeaway. Uh, my my takeaway is this: um, right now we have a Congress that can't tie its shoelaces. Um, <clears throat> right now we have a government that can't can't address uh, these problems. At the same time, I mean, any problems, much less problems as grand as these problems. At the same time, we can envision this. And reading the articles, you know, it does get you excited. It makes you think that maybe in the future, humanity can use the technology in a positive way and create a utopian society where it's, it's like science fiction. It's beautiful. It services all of us without inequity. It services all of us at a price we can afford without disparity. Oh, my goodness. This is utopian. It's beautiful. It's heavenly. And it is within our grasp. I suggest to you, Ethan, it can be done. If we focus on it, it can be done. The problem is um, we don't know how to do it. I mean, we don't know how to, you know, find political will, use the technology to better this, the life of everyone on the planet, the species in general. And that's the trouble I see. I mean, we have really got to get back to, you know, national management, national government. And until we can solve the problem of, you know, of all the problems that we're looking in the eye right now, we can't we can't find a way to get over the horizon into making a better world using this kind of promising, exciting technology. I completely agree. You said that very eloquently, Jay. Um, that that's you know, there's huge potential there. Do we have the, the sort of the, the societal and political will to to move it forward in the way it should be developed? For, for good purposes for, that will serve everyone. Um, I like to think we would, as you say, you know, I'm optimistic, so, uh, but we shall see, I guess. We shall see. We shall see on flying cars and many, many other similar things. It's a promising world. We should all live so long. Thank you, Ethan Allen. It's great to talk with you as always. Great to talk with you, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Aloha.